The topic of this talk is refugees. What we want to, to discuss today is what is the refugee crisis, in, if in fact that is what it should be called. Why are people moving en masse between different countries? Are there design ways of, of stopping that from happening? Or alternatively, are there better ways of integrating refugees into our existing cities? And also better ways of, ex of getting local people to be more accepting of refugees? Killian, would you like to kick us off, please? Okay. I have been working with the United Nations over the past, um, I would say, 25 years plus. So I've been setting up refugee camps, storage facilities for people over years. My first refugee camp I set up in 1992 in Kenya, Kakuma Camp. It still exists. What I have been working on over the last uh, three years since I decided to quit the UN is to actually realize for myself that our storytelling about refugees is completely wrong that our narrative is wrong, that we need to fundamentally change the way as how we look at it, how we look at the phenomenon of displacement, and that will help us to get out of actually talking about something for refugees. You know what? Refugees are actually human beings. It's not a species. So there is no need of tech for refugees, of design for refugees, of architecture for refugees. We all have been refugees in our history. Our families have been refugees. Displacement has been a fact in, in our lives. So what you can see here, which is a storage facility, that is the expression of 20th century post-Second World War storage of people. That's the Zatari refugee camp I managed back in 2013 and 14. That's wrong. That is what is a refugee city. Guess what that is? It's called Venice. And if you think about it, it has been built by refugees running away from us, the barbarians. But there has been no design for refugees. There has been no special setup for refugees. It has been growing into one of the most amazing cities. Again. 20th century with the logic that re refugees displacement is something temporary has created this camps. However, that one is the result of urbanization of a camp being one of the Palestinian settlements. That is what we were building after the Second World War for people who were displaced. Millions were displaced in Europe and we had responses at large for all of us and not just for some people. We have a tendency of categorizing, categorizing people into the good refugee running away from war and persecution, and the bad one who is only running away from poverty, exploitation, slavery, bonded labor, and of course, increasingly climate change. So if we look into, into people on the move at large, it is not the few people we count under the Refugee Convention. If you look at it as we should, it is one billion people currently in the world living in unsafe conditions, living in ways where they don't have a real stable environment. And that is, in fact, our challenge we have to address. How do we create spaces where people who, for one reason or another, are more dispossessed than others can live? Again. That is not the answer. That is what humanitarian agencies today to refugees, because it's our logic that only um, a, a refugee returning home as fast as possible is a good refugee. The reality in most cases is this. Thank you. Thanks very much. Reni, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and about yeah. your work? Yeah, so my name is uh, René Boer. I'm uh, working on the intersection of architecture, urbanism, heritage, uh, and politics, maybe. Sometimes from more uh, curatorial position and sometimes from more activist uh, positions. Um, I'm part of the Field Architecture Studio and the Non-Fiction uh, non Office for Critical uh, Culture. But what would be most relevant maybe for today's discussion is my involvement in the We Are Here Collective, uh, which is operating mostly in, uh, in Amsterdam which I've been ad advising and supporting for a while now. This is a group of people, like between 200 and 300 people, who came to the Netherlands to apply for asylum in the Netherlands um, over the last 
um, one to 20 years, some of them. Uh, and their applications for asylum have been rejected. So that means that they have to go back, but in many cases they can't go back. So they're here, they're in limbo, like stuck in the Netherlands. Five years ago they came together and they formed an action group and they started to occupy uh, empty properties in the Netherlands. Um, to, to provide themselves with a shelter, with uh, just a roof over their heads for, uh, for one reason, but also to gain visibility in society, to have like a large building where you can put a banner on and make yourselves visible. One example I would like to show, it is called the Vluchtmaat. It is one of the buildings they occupied and many of these refugees are evicted over time. But in this case, they made an agreement with the owner um, to actually rent it for, uh, for four or five years. And what is particularly interesting is that they redesigned the building on the inside, they transformed it, and they made like a lot of little like, uh, rooms for themselves, but also little offices they could rent out. And this money that they're making uh, by renting out these offices to small businesses, um, th they use that to pay the rent. Great, thanks a lot. Michelle, tell us a little bit about yourself and introduce us to your work. Um, yeah, my involvement with this topic is not so much from the point of view of uh, refugees, but of migration, of a little bit wider spectrum. I have an interest from two different perspectives. Uh, first, I'm a historian and um, part of this uh, Office of Crimson. Uh, secondly, I'm the director of this International Newtown Institute and it deals with the planning of cities, planned cities. So I have an interest from the point of view of history and uh, of planning. And those two come together in the project that we started two years ago, which is called A City of Comings and Goings and deals with migration in the widest sense. So not only refugees, but all um, groups of people who are actually on the move. It is a permanent phenomenon. It happens all time. So how is this possible? that we are sort of surprised by it all the time, and that we have to make these makeshift solutions every time uh, again. Why are we not prepared to deal with these, uh, uh, with these flows of people coming in and out? You could say, what does this have to do with planning or with cities or with spatial affairs? But it has a lot to do with it, especially if you look at the places where asylum seekers or newcomers are actually housed in our country. So on the borders, so the Netherlands and Germany, and completely outside of the areas where the work and the economic possibilities are. So people are housed with the idea of uh, them be giving chances to them to integrate, to get work, to get economic prosperity, but spatially they are prevented to do so. So there is absolutely a spatial question connected to this refugee problem. And the main question that interests us is how can architecture and design make our cities more adaptive we're also looking into what are the specific solutions that designers and architects, but also policy designers, uh, do to uh, make this flow of migration go smoothly into, uh, into our cities. And this will end up with a handbook and guidelines. Have you drawn any conclusions about how can we make our cities more flexible? Well, um, what we are looking into is um, building typologies and planning solutions for not only for buildings, but also public space. Uh, that uh, creates uh, different kinds of housing where actually different groups of um, uh, migrants and, for instance, students come together and share space and therefore sort of um, um, easing the um, uh, integration of, uh, of groups. So shared space, but also the uh, element of architectural quality I think is important uh, because what you see is uh, often that migrant housing is, uh, equals tempor temporary housing and very low quality. So the container housing, of course, is sort of a makeshift solution to this housing. So I think in that sense, quality is uh, uh, a thing to aspire and to um, um, accommodate this, uh, this phenomenon. And um, an interesting point you made that, and I think this is common throughout what all of you are saying, that refugees is not a new thing. It's a, a permanent phenomenon you mentioned. But why does it always take us by surprise? And why do we think of it as something exceptional and that we can't really, as a society, we tend to people are freaking out about oh. the refugees. What's well, interesting situation. actually is that um, the municipality of Amsterdam is already now preparing for like the influx of climate refugees, like in, the, in 10, 20 years from now. 
So like, how can you start to prepare now to have that ready by the time that it's becoming necessary? We're all human beings, uh, not so much, we shouldn't like designate too much of a status, like uh, this is a refugee, this is that person, but like have this inclusivity in like in housing and in work opportunities. I think that's very important. Yeah, and to add to that, you can look at very sophisticated solutions, but there are also very dumb and very effective solutions, like um, affordable housing is something that is built like an open door, both in Iraq but also in the Netherlands. We used to have a tradition in which social housing, affordable housing, uh, was abundant and was a state policy. And of course this has diminished greatly the last 20 years. And I think that is also one of the reasons that during the Kosovo crisis we didn't have any housing problems. But now we have, because many of the house, social housing stock has been sold off. So to have this quantity and this uh, sort of abundance of social housing is definitely one of the solutions that uh, you could think of. Yeah, so the absorption capacity of like Dutch cities is like way less than it was 20 years ago. Yeah. And, and, that, and that's not because of a, of a change in the number of housing, it's the change in the ownership structure. So there's, is, there's less flex. This is uh, one of the, um, uh, the results of the neoliberalization of our country in which the housing corporations uh, have sold off parts of their housing stock and um, having less um, affordable housing. Am I right in thinking that none of you are advocating that we try to stop people wanting to, to move location in the first place, that we, we accept that human migration is a kind of eternal situation and, and, and try and deal with it? Is, is that right? Well, I think to stop migration, uh, I think would be a, a very non-historical position to take. Uh, since it has never happened. And I don't mean stop it forcibly, but like m give people better conditions where they are so they're less likely to want to leave. Well, I would say uh, this is not a, a choice like either or, uh, but I think it's a matter of uh, the integration of migrants who come to Western Europe is one issue. The improvement of uh, refugee camps, which will remain necessary in, uh, in war zones or in um, climate-stricken uh, areas, is a necessity. Let, let us talk about Africa, for instance. The uh, uh, many migrants, the, most, uh, the largest majority of migrants, they don't come to, um, to Europe, they move to other countries in, in Africa. And uh, so if you look at Western Africa and the large demographic uh, changes that happen there, they nece necessitate us to also help in um, the, the planning, the organizing, in uh, accommodating that kind of uh, urban pressure. So I would say it's, it's not either or, it's and, and, and. 90% uh, of, the, of the migration, the people moving, move within. And where do they move to? to very badly managed or unmanaged spaces called the mega cities uh, growing up there. So what are the answers to this? What is the response? It is actually to begin to manage these spaces. There are new population centers growing and they're totally left alone. And that's where planners, that's where designers, that's where all the knowledge we have has to come in. What if we would create major population centers together as a community in Somalia, at the Horn of Africa, is a plenty of space to actually develop new, new living and working and economic um, opportunities. All that is being left aside. All what we're concentrating on is trying to prevent migration instead of managing it and managing actually the, the move of people within as well. And even within Europe, there are huge depopulated areas where maybe they could do with some, some enterprising refugees. That's a point you made in an interview I did with you a while back, Killian, that there's, there's space in the mountains of Spain or remote corners of Italy. If I could add something about the, um, uh, this topic and also the design community and the, the planning community, especially in Western Europe, I think they're largely overlooking this whole topic of the, the need of thinking about how to plan cities, how to organize, how to manage uh, cities and urban areas in the, the, the quickly growing parts of our, con of our world. And this is, I think, partly because we have had an, area, an era of uh, planning in the 60s and 70s, and we've grown weary of it. And now we are talking about self-organization and small scale and things. But this uh, situation that we are in as Western European countries doesn't compare uh, at all with the quickly growing African countries. 
So the need to think and conceptualize and design for this issue is not realized enough at our universities, which makes them largely irrelevant. That's a pity. So you're calling for there to be new courses in, in developing solutions at, at, the, at the small scale and also at the kind of macro planning exactly. scale, perhaps. And uh, I think what we have learned from uh, our um, decennia with, uh, with, Plena, with planning uh, comes in extremely useful for, uh, for these other areas, especially if you mix them with uh, the, the knowledge that we have of self-organization and the research of self-organization in developing countries. Who's a designer in the room here? What if these young designers, they think, I, I passionately believe in helping refugees, I believe in a fairer society, what can I do? Can you all talk about how people can get involved, the initiatives that are, that are starting to happen yeah. at grassroots level? But maybe I can start with a bit of a cynical note. I think like, we're always talking about solutions and what can design do for refugees, but maybe we should really turn it around and like, think, like, how can we undesign some structures or systems that are actually making things worse for refugees? So, like, um, I mean, like, for example, the, 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 like the border landscapes that kind of prevent people from actually moving, that are, like, very aggressive and violent. How can we as a design community, like, take that away or, or like, redesign it or undesign it or make sure that people can actually pass? I think that is something that we should think about more than these micro in interventions of, like, shoot together um, life-saving fests into something new that is, like, more of a gimmick rather than a structural solution. I think one of the, the, the mindsets that you could have as a designer uh, is, uh, well, especially as you explained, um, not to immediately think of a solution, but to make visible. Like, uh, we are here, that project was about making visible this presence of people, and therefore also creating a different story. But I think we also have not to be too naive about the power of uh, design. I mean, if you talk about the power of media, that sort of, um, you can also become a journalist or a writer or a politician. Maybe that's more effective. That's what I did. That's why I'm doing this. <laughs> But I was, I was intrigued by your point earlier about that the, 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 the education system doesn't allow for new areas of exploration. I mean, Design Academy, I interpret a lot of students have come out of there and have proposed uh, ways of, in, of engaging with the Refugee Centre. But talk a bit more about that. Like, if we were to be able to design new university courses, what would they be and, and, and how would they work? Well, I'd love to because I'm right in the middle of starting a new school, actually, especially for this reason, because I think the university systems are, have become so rigid that they have become incapable of uh, dealing with the immediate and actual questions that are out there. So they don't, they don't deal with reality, they deal with themselves. And is that in general or is particularly in, in relationship to the refugee situation? No, I think that's in general, unfortunately. So, um, and especially in this, uh, in this topic, I think it's very important to just look what is uh, happening, to have a, a, a flexible and short-term response to questions that are, are, are put before us in order to be relevant. And I think a, a small school and any small academy would be better suited for this than uh, the big universities, how they are organized at the moment. But, but so, so what is the school that you're starting then? It's called the Mascon School for the City, and um, we are going to work on actual questions that are uh, put before us in the city, work with people in the city, and not just with professionals, but also with resident organizations, could also be re with refugees, with all kinds of migrants, and um, have a m much more multifaceted approach to, uh, to building the city, to making the city. I think in that context, we have seen over the last, um, I would say, three, four years, uh, a, a real increase in, a, in an interest in many, many universities and many courses looking at urban development um, at large in the context of what I have been showing you. So the, what we launched, what I launched in the, in the past in, the, in, in Zatari, talking about this as a city rather than a storage facility and so on, has already started leading into lots of, of students and professors um, changing the, uh, the curricula from a totally different perspective. And, and particularly urban development, uh, refugee cities as such, special development zones, that seems to be really now um, taking, taking over. Uh, I think in education, or in educational practices, it's being taught like, to move beyond like, this, this, this micro scale, like to think more in terms of, of like access systems that can be scaled up. Um, 
ways to how like financial means can be organized or how specific services can be accessed on a larger scale instead of like coming with like a few products or something that uh, has been made here can only be shipped there like think about like how yeah things can be like uh, on, a, on a wider scale have you got more suggestions of people that want to do good how can we ensure that they do actual good but I, I, I would I would say I mean certainly don't design yet another shelter for refugees please this is number one uh, besides don't please don't drive to Greece and uh, bring some old clothes to Greece um, or something that's for sure a no-go but I think to get back to to really design spaces which can grow which can adapt which can be flexible which deals with deal with different people I mean we're trying to do this um, in, in Thessaloniki currently in Greece because they are young people, there, there happen to be a, a, a few thousand newcomers from elsewhere. That's what designers should do, looking into how spaces can grow, develop. And let's also not forget, sometimes these, there's more people and there's less people again. I live in Vienna. Vienna was as, as big as it is today, already 120 years ago. And then people left again. So how can we deal with this type of growth and shrinking spaces, and that's, that's what somebody should concentrate on. But don't get obsessed with yet another shelter for special people. Great, and you just have time to ask your question. Well, I know we're talking about design, but for me, technology and design is also a very interesting mix. And I was wondering what your take was on uh, what's, what's the role of technology, but then locally? Because we all think technology is, well, some people believe it's the savior of the world. Um, how is that in these refugee camps uh, locally? Do people need tech? Do they want tech? Okay, I mean, I, I think, I think it's, a, it's a crucial question. We looked into the 6,000 apps which have been designed as a response to the, to the crisis. None of the apps is, in, is, is basically applied. I mean, I don't know any. And the study we conducted, I was working with the German government last year, um, ICT for Refugees was the project, didn't find any significant change to any of the apps. And this is, again, also because the community sort of thought, well, we need to design something special for those poor little things. Thank you very much. It's been a really fascinating discussion. Um, I think that if, you, if you're a designer and you want to get involved in um, helping refugees, don't design an app, don't design a shelter, and don't take clothes to <laughs> Greece for the strongest takeouts. Thank you very much to, to all three of you. Thanks very much to the audience. And thanks for Dutch Design Week for allowing us to have this talk. And we'll be back at 4 o'clock talking about terrorism. <laughs> <laughs>